Absa's journey with blockchain has actually been quite long. We started back in 2016. Um, we were one of the first. We were the first African bank actually to join the R3 consortium, and in the same year we did one of the first cross-border trade transactions leveraging blockchain technology, which really proved to us some of the opportunity that was there. I mean, we, we, we got a much faster tra transaction cycle, which was great. We've been experimenting since then. We've done some work around self-sovereign identity, and we built a blockchain solution for identity um, for both Absa's use and for our, for our clients. And we've been involved with uh, SARPs, the South African Reserve Bank's Project COCA. Um, we started that in 2021 um, and have been building out use cases, looking at different uh, products and services which we think our clients would, would, would find, find useful and valuable. Um, and we've been experimenting with that for the last couple of years now, um, really thinking there's some real opportunity for us to offer good client, good client products for your clients, hopefully. I think in our world what we've seen is that clients want to become more agile. Um, and be able to provide their clients with a much quicker service. Um, and in addition to that, what we've seen in the global stage is that the African context really is about payments, getting money from the diaspora into countries quickly, efficiently and securely. And a lot of our work with clients have been to look at those trends, to see how they're doing it. So blockchain is being used as a core critical part of making processes quite quick, um, easy, secure, and really thinking about how we solve that need to get payments really flowing into the African continent in a way that makes sense for people, right? So, so cheaply, securely and quickly. It's really what it's, what it's all about, what that boils down to. So a lot of our client discussions have been about that. How do we help them to be more efficient um, and how do they service their clients better? It's a really interesting, I think, link to why we think blockchain is important as an organisation. I think the, the pace of execution, I mean, we, we can see transaction speeds fractions of, uh, of the time of traditional financial services pro uh, products. So one of the big benefits we see of, of blockchain is around the security of the products and services. Visibility of transactions on chain for us as an organization and for clients when they're trading with each other, we think is a real opportunity. What's interesting is that we see this whole development of Gen AI, right? This big artificial intelligence and blockchain being a part of that bigger, I'd say artificial intelligence movement. Um, a blockchain as a piece of that is quite important because the way in which transactions happen are very secure. That takes me to the thought around regulation, right? So in the digital asset space, we sit with a conundrum of making sure that regulations are followed. And globally, we've seen quite a lag in regulation for the digital, I'd say currency, digital asset space. There's been some big movement in the US market, right, with um, some significant fines, some significant lawsuits. And what we've seen is that regulation over the last year significantly tightened. For us, it's important that regulation catches up to the speed of execution in, in this space because it is the way of the future. It is a very safe, secure mechanism to do transactions for banks and for our clients. Um, and that regulation will ensure that the underlying consumer is protected. So when we think about consumer protection, probably is the most critical, um, I'd say, component of understanding how blockchain, as part of the larger payment flows, as a part of the larger infrastructure development within, I'd say, economies, banks and corporates, of how they think about how they put that together is, is very important. So I think that regulatory engagement um, for us is quite active. I mean, you've, you've spoken about our involvement with the South African Reserve Bank, but we've done that also with clients and even international regulators talking about this on a continuous basis. And I think the, the role of the regulators across our markets in Africa, I mean, I think we're actually quite lucky in many of our markets with the positive engagement we have with regulators. I think in South Africa, we know we've got the the FSCA are regulating crypto asset service providers now, which is fantastic, gives us a lot more ability to engage with the different market players because the regulators are being quite proactive, which I think is fantastic. I think that is very, I think, heartwarming, maybe very, um, you know, very positive, is that this is quite a collaborative approach. Mm. I think as the understanding of blockchain and digital assets as a wider asset class is starting to emerge, we are starting to see that engagement between regulators, clients, and even different market participants are becoming much more active. The amount of discussions I have now with clients in a week about this have tripled in the last three years. Um, and having really, I think, I'd say, inspired maybe conversations with clients, I'm yeah. um, really talking about the future of the continent. Um, as Africa, as you rightly say, as Africa, we have really, almost in a way, we've leapfrogged 
some of the developed markets. We, we didn't go through a lot of the pain um, of a lot of other developed markets. In countries like uh, Mauritius, for example, they've got very advanced uh, digital asset regulation, actually five different types of licenses, very advanced in the global, even in, in the global developed world, very advanced. So I think this is about saying, how do we do more of that so that we can really embrace Africa's future, right? Uh, tell that story together. Exactly. So tokenization is a trend that we are, we are seeing in addition to, I'd say, the, the previous um, you know, payment flows across Africa. What it does is it makes asset classes really available to the normal person. Mm -hmm. So financial services have always been a little bit outside of the ambit of a lot of, I'd say, Africans in general, just because their financial literacy has been so low. In a way, this is now taking a very complex product and simplifying that so that people can buy a piece of something. Mm -hmm. So that idea of um, access is becoming a wider conversation. So people now, even you know, every normal person on the street, you don't have to have any special uh, qualifications or special understanding, have got access now to asset classes which they just didn't have before. A person cannot maybe afford to buy a house, but they can buy a token in a property portfolio which gives them that ability to own something. Um, and that gives them, I think, this longer this longer term savings, longer term investment capability to people that are just normal people on the street. Yeah, so, so maybe one last thing, just uh, a word of kind of gratitude to the teams that we've got working in our business. I think we've got some amazing people working really hard to bring some of these blockchain solutions to life and working to kind of get them in the, into the hands of our clients over time, obviously in line with the regulations mm -hmm. in our markets as they, as they are laid down. But it's a really exciting time for our business. And I think, um, this is part of our story. I think for me it is really um, exciting to be part of this journey within APSA. And this journey in the wider economy, right? We, we talk about ourselves as being a pan-African bank and really bringing that change across, across the continent, but really to, to people, right? To, to people waiting for a payment, to a person wanting to buy an insurance product, to someone wanting to, to invest in property. That is where we see the change, so really excited. And thank you, Rob, for being part of that journey. Thank you for joining me on that journey.